Okay. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, welcome to the last Osric Lang Center Colloquium before the summer break. It is our great, great, great pleasure to uh, have doc, Dr. Sean Carroll today to give the last colloquium. Um, Sean is a research professor at Caltech and external professor at Santa Fe Institute. Besides having over 150 papers, Sean is also a writer of texts and popular books. His most recent one is called Something Deeply Hidden, and it's probably a great complimentary reading for his colloquium today. Uh, finally, let me mention as well that Sean is the host of a very interdisciplinary podcast called Mindscape that I personally recommend. So thank you, Sean, for accepting the invitation to this colloquium and for talking so early in the morning in your time zone. So please go ahead. Thanks very much. It's uh, good to almost be back to the Oscar Klein Center, where I actually visited physically a couple years ago. Uh, hope everything is going well over here. And it's a great honor to be giving this talk um, on, a, on one of my favorite subjects, which is a, you know, kind of interesting to give you just a very big background before I delve into the details. You know, I've become very interested in the foundations of quantum mechanics, the measurement problem, what's the right interpretation, things like that. M things that most physicists just can't get the time for, right? They're not, they're too impatient to worry about these things. But my contention is that thinking carefully about these issues leads you to new perspectives on something that is slightly more practical, uh, including problems in quantum gravity in particular. So that's what I wanna talk about today. And so by thinking about these issues, uh, you, know, you step back and you think about how we generally teach our students how to do quantum mechanics or indeed how we do quantum mechanical theories ourselves. Namely, we start with a classical theory, right? If you start with a simple harmonic oscillator, you're going to give the students the Hamiltonian for the simple harmonic oscillator, and you'll tell them to quantize it, right? So you derive your quantum mechanical theories from classical theories. But presumably, nature doesn't do that. Presumably, nature just is quantum mechanical from the start, and there's a classical limit, which is a slightly different kind of thing. The reason why we care is because there's at least one famous example where this paradigm of starting with the classical model and quantizing it doesn't work, which is gravity. Gravity does not seem, quantum gravity does not seem to be quantized version of general relativity. That's why people start looking at string theory or loop quantum gravity or something else. I mean, maybe it is, but we need to be a little bit more subtle about it. But the, the simple minded reading of what we've learned is that gravity just isn't quantum general relativity. Uh, it seems to have a finite number of degrees of freedom, not an infinite number. There are slightly non-local effects and black hole information and holography and things like that. So something more subtle is going on. And therefore, what I want to try is what nature does. I want to try starting with an intrinsically quantum mechanical theory and deriving the classical world from it, gravity included. So instead of quantizing gravity, we're finding gravity within a quantum mechanical model. And I'll show you how that works. We're not there yet. Uh, I'd be more excited if we were there, but it's the beginning of a program that I think has a lot of promise. So here's what I mean by quantizing a classical theory. Hopefully I'm reminding you of this, but maybe it's new to some of you. This is what we teach our students when we teach first teaching quantum mechanics. Here is a one dimensional particle in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, okay? It has a Hamiltonian with the classical, sorry, classical mechanics. There's a Hamiltonian, which is a function of X and P, the coordinate and the momentum. And the Hamiltonian function lets you get the classical equations of motion by Hamilton's equations, right? P squared plus V of X is a typical Hamiltonian. And then to make this into a quantum theory, there's different procedures called quantization. Uh, here's one, which is probably the first one that you learn. You invent something called the wave function and you take half of phase space. Phase space is X and P, position and momentum. So you take half of that, either position or momentum, and you make functions on that space. So complex valued normalizable functions. So here is a function from the real numbers to the complex numbers, call that the wave function. It's normalizable. So the integral of psi star psi is a finite number. And then that will be your new quantum state, that wave function. What about the other variable, the momentum in this case, if this is a function of position? Well, then the other variable is an operator. Right, it's from the canonical commutation relations. You derive that it is the derivative with respect to position. And then you can plug this P and this operator X into the classical Hamiltonian to get a quantum Hamiltonian, which is an operator. And it tells you the Schrodinger equation. The quantum state, the wave function will evolve according to this equation. And then, so that's fine. And you can go ahead and do quantum mechanics with that if you want. But then if you're clever or if you're John von Neumann, 
you realize that the space of these functions you invented forms a vector space, okay? It is a com complete, complex, normed vector space called Hilbert space, H. So in other words, rather than working with a function of X, which is a particular representation of the quantum mechanical state in a particular basis, the position basis, you can just work with the abstract notion of the quantum state, which is a vector in Hilbert space. So you can take these vectors and you can multiply them by complex numbers, add them together, et cetera. And there's an inner product that tells you the dot product basically between two vectors. And so at the most abstract level, if you don't say I'm starting with the classical theory and quantizing it, if you just say I have a quantum theory, what does that mean? It means that you have a Hilbert space and you have a Hamilton, okay? And that's not that much to have. Hilbert spaces, are, uh, if they're finite dimensional at least, they're just specified by the dimensionality. Like all Hilbert spaces are the same. It's not like manifolds. Different manifolds are very different from each other. But all Hilbert spaces of the same dimensionality are the same. So you just have the dimensionality. And the Hamiltonian is just an operator, just a Hermitian or self-adjoint operator on Hilbert space telling you how the system evolves forward in time. Now, I, I did mention finite dimensionality of Hilbert space there. This is a very important technicality, and I don't want to get into it too much, but if you, your Hilbert spaces are uncountably infinite in dimension, then things get trickier. And in fact, that's what happens in quantum field theory. So it's a very relevant fact, very relevant possibility, but then you need to specify some particular way of finding the physical Hilbert space in, uh, in this big infinite dimensional space. And that usually involves specifying an algebra of observables or something like that. So this dimensionality of Hilbert space, is it finite dimensional or is it infinite dimensional is a very, very important question. And very often in quantum mechanics, we assume that Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. That's because many of the Hilbert spaces that we look at as examples are infinite dimensional. The simple harmonic oscillator has an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, just because even a single harmonic oscillator can have energy levels that go from zero to infinity. So it's countably infinite, but it's still an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Likewise, when you become a little bit more sophisticated and you start doing quantum field theory, uh, in the limit where you can think about all your fields as free fields, each mode of each field, at least bosonic fields, look like a simple harmonic oscillator, right? So there's an infinite number of oscillators and every oscillator has an infinite number of possible states. So the Hilbert space of quantum field theory is clearly infinite dimensional. I, I wanna emphasize that's not because the wavelength of the modes can be infinitely big or infinitely small. It's true that in quantum field theory, the wavelength of the modes can be infinitely big and infinitely small. But even if you put cutoffs on, so you have a UV cutoff for a smallest wavelength, an infrared cutoff for a longest wavelength, each mode still has an infinite dimensional Hilbert space associated with it. So the overall quantum field theory Hilbert space is still infinite dimensional. So therefore, a lot of people working in high energy physics would just naturally treat infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces as their playground. But gravity changes things. And I think this is a hugely important feature of quantum gravity that is quite overlooked because people don't start from this quantum states in Hilbert space first approach. They start with some classical theory and they're quantizing it. But if you just think about Hilbert space and what's going on, there's a major difference between quantum gravity and quantum field theory. And the basic difference is that gravity provides a cutoff on how much energy you can put into a region, right? You have a region of a fixed size and you try to imagine there are quantum states in that region and you, and you excite them. In quantum field theory, you can excite them infinitely far. But in a theory with gravity, once you excite them enough, you'll have so much energy in your region that the whole thing will collapse to a black hole. And once you have a black hole in there, there's no more freedom to do things there. If you put any more energy in it, the black hole will become bigger than your region. So for any fixed region of space-time with a fixed size, L, there's a maximum number of things you can do quantum mechanically in that region. And what that corresponds to in the Hilbert space language is the dimensionality of the part of Hilbert space that describes what goes on in a region of fixed size is finite dimensional. If you want, you can think of the horizon. We're talking to cosmologists here, right? We have an observable universe around us, which is finite in size. 
So this reasoning says whether or not there are actually black holes, it still says that in that region of our observable universe, there's only a finite dimensional Hilbert space that you need to describe what can happen. So this instantly implies that whatever quantum gravity is, it's not a quantum field theory, if you believe that this is true, because quantum field theories have infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And you know, we even know how big the Hilbert space is supposed to be. This comes to us from uh, Bekenstein and Hawking calculating the entropy, right? We know the entropy of the event horizon of a black hole and black holes are not only uh, maximum energy that we can put into a region, they're maximum entropy that we can put into a region. So we have the formula for entropy, which is basically the area of the black hole event horizon in Planck units up to a factor of four. And we also know that if you have a quantum system that is at maximum entropy, we know how much Hilbert space you need to describe that system. And it's basically e to the entropy. So it's pretty big. It's a very, very big number. So for instance, for one cubic centimeter of space, this reasoning tells you that the Hilbert space that would describe what can happen inside that cubic centimeter has a dimensionality of e to the 10 to the 66. It's a very, very big number, even before you get to cosmological length scale. So that's why we can be for forgiven for thinking that is practically infinite. But it's not infinite, and that matters, okay? There's a difference between a big finite number and an infinite number. And one difference is that when you specify the quantum theory, remember in an uncountably infinite dimensional Hilbert space, you need to do more work. You need to say what the algebra of observables was. But in a finite dimensional Hilbert space, there's no more work to be done. Once you have the Hilbert space and the Hamiltonian, you're done. The algebra of observables is just every Hermitian operator on that finite dimensional Hilbert space. So in our quest to go from a quantum mechanical theory to find the classical world emerging from it, we have very little to work with, okay? We have the universe described by a vector in Hilbert space obeying the Schrodinger equation. Let me drive home how, uh, how radical that is, okay? So this version of the Schrodinger equation that I've written down, sometimes you might think that the Schrodinger equation is just for non-relativistic spinless particles, but that's not true. The Schrodinger equation is way more general than that. The Schrodinger equation is completely equivalent to the path integral of Feynman or, or any other and more algebraic ways of doing quantum mechanics. It completely captures the dynamics of any quantum mechanical system. Quantum field theories, relativistic theories, they can all be cast in this Hamiltonian form, in which case the Schrodinger equation is the right dynamical equation. And the other important thing about this equation is X never appears, okay? So if you're thinking about old fashioned non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you think of the quantum state as psi of X. But like we said, there's a more general way of thinking about it. It's a vector in Hilbert space. So psi of X is a particular representation of the wave function. And the representation that you're using doesn't appear in this equation. This is completely general. So what that means is that all of the usual stuff that we talk about, what philosophers would call the ontology of your theory, okay? Space, full of fields, interacting locally, all of those words do not appear anywhere in our fundamental description of the quantum theory of the natural world. <laughs> the fundamental description of the quantum theory is just a Hamiltonian acting on a vector in Hilbert space. So we're allowed to use words that are sort of Hilbert space centered, like uh, entanglement and density matrices and stuff like that. But we're not allowed to use words like space and fields and locality because those aren't fundamental. Those are things that we need to see emerging from this Hilbert space vector evolving according to the Schrodinger equation. That is the task that we have set ourselves. So just to drive home, I'm gonna be a little bit redundant and repetitive here because it is a different perspective than we're used to thinking about. Um, you might think to yourself, well, look, I, I don't just have the Hamiltonian, I can look at the Hamiltonian and I can see from the form of the Hamiltonian what it is, right? Like, so if you give me this particular quantum mechanical Hamiltonian, right? D squared, dx squared plus x squared with various prefactors in front, you would recognize that once you've taken your quantum mechanics course as the simple harmonic oscillator, right? That is the Hamiltonian for a single simple harmonic oscillator. And so you say, well, how hard can it be to look at a Hamiltonian and figure out what it is? Well, the answer is it can be hard because you've cheated in this particular example. You've given me not just the Hamiltonian, you've given me the Hamiltonian in a very, very special basis for Hilbert space, namely the position basis. 
who gave you that? Where did that come from? Why is the position basis so special? Th these are answerable questions, but the answers aren't obvious. We need to think about why the position basis is so special. It's certainly not special in Hilbert space all by itself, right? Hilbert space doesn't care what basis you put it in. Given that our theory is being defined by the Hamiltonian acting on vectors in Hilbert space, there is one preferred basis that we know about, which is the energy eigenbasis, right? Given the Hamiltonian, we can ask, what are the eigenvectors of that Hamiltonian and its eigenvalues? So here are the set of energy eigenvalues and eigenvectors for the Hamiltonian. The specific vectors in Hilbert space that are the energy eigenvectors, even they don't matter, right? They're just some set of orthogonal vectors. What makes these vectors special is that they have an energy eigenvalue attached to them. So when I say, what is the Hamiltonian for a theory? The most, sorry, what, what should I say? The way of answering that question that doesn't cheat that doesn't assume some preferred basis from the start is just to list the set of energy eigenvalues. You can always, you're allowed to give the Hamiltonian and express it in its energy eigenbasis, in which case it's a diagonal matrix. And the only data there are the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, which is called the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. So the task we are setting ourselves is that someone hands you a list of a finite number of real numbers the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, the energy eigenvalues, and says, what is this? What is the world that this describes? And that's a, that, that's a hard problem. So just to drive it home, finally, um, this is the task that we are setting to ourselves. We get a finite list of numbers, the energy eigenvalues, and we're supposed to say, oh yes, that is the standard model of particle physics propagating in a three plus one dimensional space time coupled to general relativity, okay? How in the world can we go from a finite list of energy eigenvalues to all the richness of the world? It's a very, very long list of energy eigenvalues. Remember, e to the 10 to the 66, just for a cubic centimeter of space, or e to the 10 to the 120 for the whole observable universe. So a very, very long list. But what is the procedure? What is the recipe, the algorithm for going from that list to some notion of space and in, and fields and in gauge invariants and Lorentz invariants and all those things. How do we do that? Okay. Well, remember, we, we cautioned ourselves that we're not allowed to cheat by assuming the position basis, right? For something like the uh, harmonic oscillator, we should be able to derive the fact that that is a special basis. That is a useful basis for us to look at the harmonic oscillator. And it's not the only one. You can look at the, you know, um, energy basis, right, for the harmonic oscillator also, but the position basis is very useful. Why? Well, you know, because we see it, we look at it, like we have a harmonic oscillator in terms of, a, you know, a, a ball on a spring moving back and forth, and we look at it, and we see where it is, we see its position, okay? So we would like to take that intuition that there's something that we immediately perceive when we look at a system as special, you know, we live in position space, right? We don't live in momentum space. So where does that come from? How can you formalize that intuition and turn it into an algorithm for finding a good way to think about this abstract Hilbert space? So from the quantum mechanical point of view, when you say position is what we see when we look at things, what we're secretly doing is we're factorizing Hilbert space. We're saying that we have this big vector space, but we can think of it as a product of subsystems, right? If you remember your quantum mechanics course, in quantum mechanics, we, we treat the Hilbert space of a composite system as the tensor product of the individual Hilbert spaces. So if you have two spins, there's a two-dimensional Hilbert space for each spin. The combined Hilbert space for both spins is the four-dimensional tensor product. Likewise, in this case, we're factorizing implicitly Hilbert space into a system like the harmonic oscillator or whatever, an observer or an apparatus or whatever you want to call it. I'm not giving any special status to conscious creatures or anything like that or agents. When I say observer, it could be a video camera or it can be some, some other part of nature that is interacting with the quantum system. And then you have the environment. You have literally everything else. 
I, I should also say implicitly that for those of you who are experts in quantum mechanics, in the foundations of quantum mechanics, uh, I'm implicitly using an Everettian or many worlds perspective on how to think about the foundations of quantum mechanics. So the only thing that I have is the Hilbert space and the Hamiltonian. I do not have a way that the wave function collapses or I do not have hidden variables or anything like that. I have none of that to help myself to. So I do need to think about the whole Hilbert space for the whole universe, including the environment, okay? So, but again, factorizing Hilbert space is a non-trivial step. So usually when we do this in class, we start with the individual pieces. Here's an electron with a spin. There's another electron with a spin. We multiply, we tensor product them to get to, together to get the whole Hilbert space. Here we want to go backwards. We want to say, here's the whole Hilbert space. How do I factorize it? How do I divide it up into subsystems to make the whole thing in a way that is useful in some sense? And then you got to say, well, what do you mean by useful? And there's different criteria for being useful, but what I want you to have in mind is we're looking for a classical limit. Right? We're trying to go from a quantum mechanical description of reality to the classical world, eventually to classical space-time obeying Einstein's equation with quantum fields propagating in it. So the primary criterion we'll be using is how does a classical limit arise? And the answer is you got to factorize Hilbert space in the right way to make that happen. So this step is what we call quantum muriology. Muriology is the study of the relationship between the whole thing and its parts, okay? So we have the whole Hilbert space and we're asking how do you divide it up? How do you carve up Hilbert space into pieces in a useful way? So the Hamiltonian is all we have to work with. And it's just a map from Hilbert space to itself. It's an operator on Hilbert space. You give me a vector, I act the Hamiltonian on it, I get another vector in Hilbert space. If I'm looking at some particular decomposition of Hilbert space. So I have the whole Hilbert space and I write it in some factorization as HA tensor HB, where HA and HB are sub Hilbert spaces. Then in that factorization, that corresponds to a way of thinking about the Hamiltonian. I can divide up the Hamiltonian into the self Hamiltonian for system A all by itself. That is to say operators that look like something acting on A times the identity acting on B. Then there's a self Hamiltonian for subsystem B. And there's, a, there's an interaction Hamiltonian, a set of operators perhaps that couple things in A to things in B, okay? So this is the relationship between this factorization and the Hamiltonian. And we can ask which factorization of Hilbert space amongst all the different factorizations you might want to imagine gives us something like a system acting classically. So that's gonna be the first step that we look at. Now, again, I'm, I know that you've taken quantum mechanics before, so you think you know how to take the classical limit of a quantum system. But what I'm here to tell you is there's actually two aspects to being classical when it comes to quantum mechanics. And you've probably been taught one of them, but not the other one, depending on how good your quantum mechanics class was, okay? The first aspect is you want the wave function of the quantum system in the classical limit to remain more or less localized, right? When the earth is going around the sun, the earth is a big classical system. The wave function corresponding to the center of mass of the earth doesn't spread out over its whole orbit. It remains pretty localized. And this is captured in Ehrenfest's theorem. And you can talk very specifically about that. And probably you did in your quantum mechanics class. But that's, again, that's not the whole story because we said, you know, if the wave function of the earth is localized, then it stays localized. But how did it get localized in the first place? That is also part of classical behavior. The earth is not spread out all over its orbit in its wave function, right? Well, why not? And the answer is that entanglement happens if you do get spread out all over your environment. So think about Schrodinger's cat, okay? Think about this cat that Schrodinger has put into a superposition I usually put the cat into a superposition of awake and asleep rather than alive or dead since I'm a cat person. But as we now know, and what Schrodinger didn't quite know, but he sort of vaguely understood the basics here, is that if you think about not just the cat, but the wave function of everything, the wave function of the whole universe, including all of the atoms of air or photons in the box where the cat is, that's the environment. And that environment interacts with the cat all the time, right? So here's a photon that is going along in the box where the cat is. And the point is that the photon would be absorbed by the cat if it were awake and standing up, 
but it would just miss the cat if the cat were asleep and lying down. In other words, that photon will immediately become entangled with the cat in a superposition of two macroscopic, uh, different macroscopic states, okay? That's why you never see the cat in a superposition of awake and asleep. And that's why you never see big macroscopic systems in superpositions of different parts, different physical locations. Because if they did, they would quickly become entangled with the environment. And from an Everettian point of view, we say the wave function of the universe has branched into separate worlds, okay? Uh, once you become entangled with the environment, decoherence happens and you're no longer in that superposition all by yourself. So what this decoherence process does is it tells us that in each classical looking branch of the wave function, uh, you don't entangle anymore. So there's two important parts of this process. One is if you were in a superposition, macroscopically different, you would instantly entangle with the environment. But once you look classical and localized in some position, you don't, you don't keep entangling, right? Photons keep interacting with you, but they all interact with you in the same way. So they don't become entangled with you. That's the other aspect of being classical. So one aspect is that localized states remain localized, but the other is that unentangled states remain unentangled. So the cat has more than Avogadro's number of particles in it, but it doesn't get that much entanglement. It doesn't have separate amounts of entanglement with every atom in its body and the surrounding environment. That's a crucially important part of the classical limit of quantum mechanics. So what you wanna do is you wanna say, given the whole Hilbert space, we wanna factorize it into a system, HS, and an environment, HE, such that you satisfy these two criteria, right? And the two criteria are localized systems in the system remain localized, and unentangled systems in the system remain unentangled, or they become a little bit entangled like Schrodinger's cat, and then they stop becoming even more entangled. If there's continuous entanglement being generated, you don't really have a good classical limit, okay? So that suggests a way to factorize Hilbert space in what we call the most useful way. The right factorization of the Hilbert space is the one in which these classical criteria can be met. So this is work I did with Ashmeet Singh, who was a grad student at Caltech, and we found that these two criteria work in, in the sense that we could take a simple quantum mechanical system that we think we understood, that we thought we knew what the right factorization was, namely two harmonic oscillators coupled to each other with a little weak interaction between them, okay? And then that gives us the right factorization, we think, you know, because you have a position basis for one, the position basis for the other, and a small interaction. And then we said we defined a, a number, which we called the Schwinger entropy, which the minimizing that number minimized uh, both of these criteria we had. And we found that in the typical standard classical factorization of the system, it worked, it minimized that Schwinger entropy compared to any other factorization you might wanna have. So that's what this plot is. This is many, this is the right factorization, the quasi-classical factorization. This is this number you're trying to minimize. And as you change the factorization away from the classical one, this number gets bigger and bigger. So we think it's true. Uh, you know, we need to do more work because this is very young and we need to think about it more, but we think that just based on the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, just based on the list of energy eigenvalues, you can pick out the right way to factor Hilbert space to get classical behavior. So that's a good um, step along the way to recovering the real world. The next step, what about locality? What about space, right? We were thinking in that previous section about things like Schrodinger's cat or you know, two state systems, uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Let's think about space itself and maybe even space time, but mostly I'll be talking about space to be honest. Um, and in the back of my mind now, we have the idea that we know that what works in the real world is quantum field theory, right? At least to some very good approximation, quantum field theory is an excellent description of the world in which we live. And quantum field theory has this very special property that even the vacuum is an interesting place, right? The vacuum state of quantum field theory or any state in a quantum field theory can be subdivided into what's going on in different regions. This is because quantum field theories are local in space, okay? So this is supposed to be re re resemble a picture of space, 
and I'm describing what happens in different regions of space. And in a quantum field theory, and this, there's some footnotes here. If you're an expert, when you get into gauge theories, you have to be more careful and more subtle, but we're not being very careful right now to a good approximation. Uh, this is very accurate. In a quantum field theory, you can assign, you can associate each region of space with a factor of Hilbert space, right? You can think about the density matrix corresponding to a different region, what's going on in that region. And you know that because of locality, because of locality of the Hamiltonian, the degrees of freedom in any one region will interact with their nearest neighbors directly, but they do not interact with parts of the Hilbert space far away, not directly, that's locality. If I poke the quantum state here at one particular location, the influence of my poking will spread out at the speed of light or more slowly through uh, all of space. So again, this suggests a relationship between this factorization of Hilbert space into local regions and the form of the Hamiltonian, right? The Hamiltonian, once you imagine a factorization, and remember, we're not being given this factorization by God or anything, we're looking for it, okay? So what's so special about this factorization of Hilbert space into local regions? The answer is that if you write the Hamiltonian as again, a self Hamiltonian for each region, plus interactions. And so these are a set of interactions between nearest neighbors or between any two, I should say any two sub factors. And there's more interactions between three sub factors and so forth. If your Hamiltonian is local, then this series will truncate. This is in, in, in principle an infinite uh, series. But in fact, if you divide up uh, Hilbert space into finite numbers of regions, Sorry, I should say, if you divide up, if you divide Hilbert space, if you divide space into a sort of a lattice structure such that every part of space only has a finite number of neighbors, is what I'm trying to say. It's very early in the morning. Only have had had my half my cup of coffee. Sorry about that. If you divide space in a lattice structure where every point or every region of space only has a finite number of neighbors, a local Hamiltonian will only have a finite number of terms that look like this. In fact, it's more special than that, right? Because the interactions will only be with those nearest neighbors, but that's an even stringer, more stringent criterion. And so that's what computer scientists would call a K-local. Hamiltonian, right? It's a little bit weaker criterion than locality, but there is something special about the form of the Hamiltonian in the correct factorization. The point is, given exactly the same Hamiltonian, but a different factorization, every subfactor of Hilbert space would be interacting with every other one. That's the generic situation. You're looking for the special situation where there's only nearest neighbor interactions. So sadly for me, I was scooped on getting this. Kotler, Pennington, and Renard actually wrote this paper in 2017, and they showed that most Hamiltonians don't have any local factorization. If you have a generic list of energy eigenvalues, there's no way to factorize Hilbert space to make it look like local interactions. And when there is, when you have a special Hamiltonian, a special list of energy eigenvalues that allows you to decompose Hilbert space in the right way to look local, that factorization is essentially unique. And basically the argument is just that the number of parameters in a local Hamiltonian is much, much less than the number of energy eigenvalues once you get a, a big Hil Hilbert space. So what this is saying is that the criterion of only having local interactions tells you how to factorize the Hilbert space of a theory that will ultimately kind of approximately look like a local quantum field theory, right? Or a local lattice theory or something like that. In other words, just like the system environment split, the local structure of space, the topology of this graph, if you think about this as a graph where every node is a factor of Hilbert space and every edge is an interaction, the topology of this graph is picked out more or less uniquely by the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. So you can find that structure, you can find space in the Hamiltonian, even if the Hamiltonian is just a list of energy eigenvalues. Good, that's very exciting, but it's less than we would like, right? Because all this is telling you is in some sense, the topology of this graph, the, 
set of given one factor of Hilbert space, what other factors does it interact with? That's what's telling you that. But you see where we're going. You're getting excited, right? Because we're starting from a list of energy eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. We're building up space. What we would like is for that space to be dynamical, to not just have a topology, but to have a geometry and let that geometry be dynamical and sort of general relativity, general relativity like, okay? Now this comes very close to a big, pick, a big very um, popular topic in quantum gravity these days, which is the entanglement geometry connection, okay? This is, you know, the it from qubit um, project is finding the geometry of space-time emerging from quantum entanglement. And this certainly goes way back before I started thinking about it. But there's a, a footnote here, which is that almost everybody who talks about this stuff is talking about it in the context of ADS-CFT. What they're doing is, and starting with work by Swingle and Van Romsdonk and others, what they're saying is uh, in ADS-CFT, you have a connection between, let's say, four-dimensional quantum field theory or an n-dimensional quantum field theory without gravity and a five-dimensional or n plus one-dimensional quantum theory with gravity with anti disitter boundary conditions, okay? So two different numbers of dimensions, one theory with gravity over here, one theory without gravity over there, one Maldusena teaches us that they're supposed to be dual to each other. What Swingle and Van Romsdonk and others pointed out is that there's a relationship between entanglement in the boundary theory and the geometry on the bulk theory, okay? And, uh, especially in, in Mark Van Romsdong's papers, you can see explicitly, he changes the amount of entanglement on the boundary and he sees dramatic changes in the geometry of space in the bulk theory, okay? Very exciting, very popular, hot topic these days. I'm not doing that. That's not what we're doing, okay? As, as fun as that is and as useful as it is and as educational as it is, we don't live in anti de Sitter space. You know, those of you who are working cosmologists in the, in the audience will know, we, if anything, we live in something closer to de Sitter space, right? We have a positive cosmological constant. So I'm a big believer that ADS CFT is useful for learning in principle general features of quantum gravity. But personally, I'm a more down to earth guy. I wanna learn about the real world. I wanna know why apples fall from trees and why the earth goes around the sun, okay? So I'm not doing entanglement on the boundary versus gravity in the bulk. I wanna work just in the bulk. I wanna do gravity in this room where I am right now, gravity in the solar system, okay? And so on the one hand, I don't have the, all the beauty and the machinery of the ads CFT correspondence. On the other hand, here in my room, it's the weak field limit of gravity, right? It, there's no holography, there's no black holes, there's no cosmological event horizon nearby. So gravity is local in this room. So I can just think about the weak field limit and we can ask, can we get local weak field Einstein equations from gravity right here in the bulk of space-time without any ads CFT boundary? So the answer is yes, basically. I mean, there's a long list of assumptions. We don't know whether they're true or not, but we can tell you the conditions under which the answer is yes. So. Again, take some inspiration from what we know about quantum field theory. Here, this picture that I've just drawn is the vacuum of quantum field theory, okay? No particles, don't worry about anything like that. It's empty space, okay? And what we know from just ordinary quantum field theory is if you take space and you divide it into regions, you can calculate the entanglement between two regions. In fact, it's infinite because there's an infinite number of degrees of freedom, but you can cut it off in various interesting ways. And what you find is that the uh, two regions of space-time, the corresponding Hilbert space factors, will be highly entangled if those regions are nearby. They will be a little bit entangled, not zero, but a much smaller amount of entanglement if those regions are far away. So again, that's a result in quantum field theory. So you start with space, you start with the metric on space, distance measure, you start with the vacuum state and you can calculate this amount of entanglement. But what it suggests is maybe we can go the other way around. Remember, Kotler et al. told us there will be, given the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, a unique way to factorize it to make it look local and that's purely a feature of the Hamiltonian. Now we're talking about features of the state, okay? Given the Hamiltonian, we have a vacuum state or something close to the vacuum state. And we know from field theory that in something close to the vacuum state, regions that are nearby will be highly entangled. So let's go the other way around. We don't know what it means to say a region is nearby, but we know what it means to say two factors of Hilbert space are highly entangled given a state. And in this case, the state is something close to the vacuum state, okay? 
So let us define what we mean by nearby as highly entangled and far away as not very entangled. In other words, let's use the entanglement data of the vacuum state to define a metric on this finite dimensional lattice structure. And since it's a very, very big lattice, there's a lot of degrees of freedom going around. You can ask, is there a best fit smooth geometry to this entanglement structure? And the answer is again, sometimes yes. And when it is, there are well-known applied math techniques for taking a finite structure like this and finding the best fit smooth geometry. So we can do that. So in this case, it's just an onsatz at this level. We didn't prove anything, but what we're saying is if you define a metric based on entanglement, you can use that to just describe a smooth geometry on your system. And then the next step, this relates geometry to entanglement. We can also relate entanglement to energy. Because remember on the previous slide, we were looking at the vacuum state. Now let's not look at the vacuum state. Again, in, we get inspired by quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, if you have particles that let's say in two regions of space, there's a little bit more energy in the theory now because you're not a vacuum state. You've excited it to put two particles in there. There's also a little bit less entanglement between this region of space and its neighbors because you've had to break a little bit of entanglement to excite the mode of the quantum field that is representing that particle. And again, there's a lot more math going on here that I'm showing you. I can encourage you to read the papers. I'll show you a little bit of the math at the very end. But the point is that there is a rigorous relationship between the amount of energy in your state and the entanglement structure of that state. So once you add particles, you change the entanglement in a very productive way and a very predictable way. And so we relate entanglement to energy. And that means that we have this. We have a relationship between the geometry of space emerging from our entanglement structure and the entanglement, and also the energy in space and the entanglement structure. Therefore, there's a relationship between geometry and energy. But guess what? Einstein already invented that. We've been scooped even longer ago. You know, 100 years ago, Einstein told us that there's a relationship between geometry and energy, and he called it general relativity. The geometry of space is affected by the stress energy tensor of the stuff in the universe, okay? But the point is, Einstein postulated that there's a relationship between geometry and energy. That was his theory, right? He said, look, I have an equation, here you go. We did not postulate that. We postulated there, there is a metric on space emerging from the entanglement structure. And if that's true, it is the most natural thing in the world for that metric to be dynamical and to respond to energy because the metric is depending on the quantum state. The quantum state will evolve with time if it's not the vacuum state, right? The vacuum state will just be static, but a more generic excited state will be dynamical and it will have a dynamical metric. And then again, so I can, I can give you the references for the paper. We have not in any sense derived this rigorously, but we've said if the following assumptions, natural seeming assumptions are true, then we get a result like this. There's a lot of open questions like Lorentz invariance and gauge invariance and things like that. These are real uh, potentially hard questions to answer, but they're finite questions, right? They're, like, they're not like, oh, I hope it works. It's like, well, here's what we need to do next. And that's what we're trying to do. So the point is, if you use data purely from Hilbert space and the quantum state to define what's going on, it is actually very natural for curved space time and even Einstein's equation in the weak field limit to arise, to emerge from that kind of structure. So if you want a little bit more equations and some references, this is the slide for you. Um, uh, it's actually, our, how we did it is closely related. I need to give credit to work by Ted Jacobson um, first in 1995, and then a follow-up paper in 2015. What Jacobson did is uh, his famous Einstein equation of state paper, where he said, rather than positing Einstein's equation, you can posit a relationship between the area of a little region of space and the entropy passing through it, okay? So in fact, the deltas here are to say, if you have the vacuum state and you perturb it a little bit by adding some entropy, if you postulate that there's a corresponding geometric change in area, then Jacobson is able to derive Einstein's equation. And this is all math that you can do. Uh, you need to understand what a modular Hamiltonian is, et cetera. You need to take some limits and the infrared limit and things like that. But at the end of the day, you get that the zero, zero component of the Einstein tensor is proportional to the zero, zero component of the energy, which is the energy density. And if that's true in every Lorentz frame, then you get Einstein's equation in that in every frame. So to Jacobson, 
the crucial step was he already had space time, right? He's working in a space time and his assumption was that there was a relationship between entropy and area of this form. We don't have space time, uh, but we have an emergent space time and it's actually quite natural in our setup for there to be a relationship between entropy and area since we're defining area and all those other geometric quantities in terms of entanglement and entropy and things like that. So we are sort of doing what Jacobson did, but at one step backward where we don't even have space time to start, we get that emergent from the wave function. So there's a long way to go. We are nowhere close to uh, declaring victory or anything like that. It's a different take on how to get quantum gravity. And you know we are not, solving the black hole information problem. We don't even have holography in there yet. We have some ideas for how to get it in there. Uh, but right now we're really trying to describe why apples fall from trees. And we think we can do that in a purely quantum mechanical way. So here's what we want to happen. The idea is that just to review, we start from nothing but Hilbert space and the Hamiltonian, right? There's a vector in Hilbert space, the most bare bone quantum description you can get. We can carve that Hilbert space in an emergent way into what we call systems and what we call environments by asking for classical behavior. And then we can go beyond that a little bit to actually asking for local behavior. How do you think about what we think of as quantum field theory arising locally, again, from the Hamiltonian that can happen. And then if you use entanglement to de define an emergent metric, you get you can derive Einstein's equation in the weak field limit. So many issues remain. This may or may not actually go forward. Uh, you know, I didn't mention string theory or loops or causal sets or anything like that. Maybe these approaches are related to each other in some ways. There's things we don't yet know. Like I said, Lorentz invariance and uh, gauge invariance and stuff like that. But in some sense, I, I, it, what I like about this is I'm not guessing. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying, well, maybe it's a string, right? Maybe it's, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, some structure on a lattice or anything like that. I'm using principles of quantum mechanics that I think should be true. And I'm saying that if these principles of quantum mechanics are true, then you naturally get a curved emergent space time. So that's a, I think to me, nature probably works that way. Maybe we human beings should give it a try also. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Okay. Now we have time for questions. Um, there is already a few uh, raised hands. So let's start with Mati. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Should I, should I, should I stop uh, slide sharing? Uh, it's up to you. Maybe you can uh, keep them because maybe some people are going to refer to them. Okay, I might go back. That's that's fair. Please, Mati. Not sure. Okay, so maybe later. Uh, Michael? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yep. Um, I was wondering. Um, what determines in, in this picture that space has a fixed dimensionality? Why, why three and why even an integer and why doesn't, why, why is it fixed in, in all of space? Um, is there some easy answer yeah. to see? This? Well, so um, note that you could ask that to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Why does space have three dimensions, right? It does not, that is not unique to my uh, program, but I know why you're asking because it sort of naturally gets raised because it could have been anything, right? I mean, what we're saying here is that the structure of the Hamiltonian, the structure of the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, the low lying states defines the dimensionality of space when there is any. Again, a generic Hamiltonian wouldn't give you rise to anything like a smooth space at all. So you have to pick a special kind of Hamiltonian. And that makes sense, right? The laws of physics are not random. There, there's some structure there. Um, but why is three dimensions? Well, that's the Hamiltonian we have. That's the Hamiltonian of the universe. So the only difference between my answer to that and anybody else's is my starting point is the Hamiltonian. Other people would start with space is three dimensional or space is nine dimensional if you're a string theorist or whatever, but it is the starting point for making things work. So it's encoded in the eigen spectrum of the Hamiltonian. Can, can I ask a quick follow up then? Yeah. Uh, so so where, where, where would you see this in the eigen spectrum that it is three dimensional? Yeah, we actually have, we have a couple of, I didn't show you, but we did, we did a couple of plots 
um, for we have a, a one dimensional system and a two dimensional system that we know the energy eigenspectrum and the entanglement spectrum. Um, and we, you know, we sort of forgot what they were and we found that we could recover what they were, right? Just from the spectrum. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's, it's roughly, what is the difference between the energy spectrum of one harmonic oscillator and two harmonic oscillators, right? You know, it's one is a, uh, a, an infinite tower with equal spacing and one is a sum of two infinite towers with maybe slightly different spacings or something like that. So there will be a different structure to those energy eigenvalues uh, for exactly, in exactly the same way. Okay, uh, Mati. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, uh, so thank you for your talk, it was very interesting. I was thinking, how did, uh, whether it was finite or infinite number of dimension comes into your Hamiltonian, did that matter? I didn't really hear why it was important. Well, it, it, it's support, it's, I wouldn't say it's important, but I think it's true, uh, there's, and there's two reasons. Number one is, as, as I tried to say, um, I think that's the correct, finite dimensionality is the correct thing to look at in the real world because of gravity and because we have a positive cosmological constant and a horizon around us. The Hilbert space of the universe might very well be infinite dimensional, but it should be countably finite if it's finite in every region of space. Uh, and in particular, we can think of the relevant part of our observable universe as being a finite dimensional factor of Hilbert space. So that's very different than the quantum field theory um, expectation. The other reason why it's sort of at a technical level important to note is because um, if Hilbert space were uncountably infinite in dimension, then specifying the Hamiltonian uh, eigenspectrum is not enough to pick out the quantum theory. You need, because there are incompatible, uh, inequivalent unitary representations of the canonical commutation relations. So there's more data you need to specify what quantum theory you're looking at. And people who do, you know, axiomatic quantum field theory are very familiar with this. If you start with a free field theory, you have a perfectly well-defined Hilbert space, et cetera, but then you, you know, add a perturbation to it, you're in a different Hilbert space suddenly. And it, it's a technical complication. So on the one hand, I didn't want to face that technical complication. On the other hand, I don't have to because gravity provides me with a cutoff. Yes, uh, regarding that cutoff, I mean, the uh, limit on black hole is only in vacuum, right? Otherwise, if you rewind universe a billion years, you would end up that universe should have collapsed to a black hole, since it, the observable universe at that time would have contained more energy than what would be allowed with that limit. Well, no, the, it, I mean, it did. There's a singularity in the past of the universe. The past of the universe is like a white hole, right? It, it, there is the singularity theorems don't say whether the singularity is in the past or future. They just say there is a singularity. So yes, the, but uh, the region did contain more energy than what your the limit. No, no, it didn't. I mean, the uh, limit scales with the area, right? Yeah, I so mean, you can go through the map. always be a, a certain time in the past where the observable universe had more energy and the area was too small for it. Well, but then it hits a singularity, yeah, and the, the classical description is no longer very good. Yeah, but that time in the past wasn't very long ago. It's just a billion years ago. I mean, if you take the observable universe today and rewind it a billion years, and you see how oh. much energy was it and how big was the observable universe we see today at that time. Well, sorry, there's, so there's two things going on. Remember, uh, the, the limit that I put is not on energy, it's on the number of different kinds of states, right? If the state that you're in is a high energy one, but there's still just a, some finite number of them, that's all that we need to talk about what I, what I talk about. But I also think that you know you can't apply this logic to regions that are larger than the horizon size. The the implicit notion here is that uh, you need to look at the universe piece by piece in regions that are smaller than that uh, than that. What what is the name of it? Um, there's some name for the region past which there's enough energy to make a black hole necessarily. So I, I'm I'm looking at uh, space time locally in that sense. Yeah, and my last question was regarding the time in your Hamiltonian. What is that time? It's the time. So this, 
formulation uh, imagines that the Schrodinger equation is the fundamental equation of the universe. So there is a time parameter. It need not be a preferred time parameter because you can do a Lorentz boost or something like that. It's, it's exactly just like the Schrodinger picture of quantum field theory, right? Um, you can pick a Lorentz frame, evolve everything with respect to time that secretly, implicitly, there's Lorentz invariance in your theory. So you could do a boost and pick a different time variable, but there is a, in any particular way of writing down the theory, there's a state evolving with time. Okay, thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> further related, there was a question in the chat before. Someone was asking a clarification about this sentence. In a fine dimension, in a fine dimension, the variables are all the emission operators. And then uh, the person was asking what's the difference between that and the infinite dimensional case. Well, yeah, so there's two things. One is, again, if you're really into the subtleties of quantum mechanics, once you're in infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, there's, there becomes a distinction between self-adjoint operators and Hermitian operators, right? In finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, those two things are the same thing. And so we're often, when we're taught quantum mechanics, we're taught Hermitian operators, right? The Hamiltonian should be Hermitian. Um, and maybe it's mumbled to you that that's equivalent to being self-adjoint. Self-adjoint means, you know, you act on the bra or the cat with the uh, conjugate, the adjoint, and you get the same answer. Um, but in the infinite dimensional case, Hermitian and self-adjoint don't mean the same thing. And what you really care about for observables in quantum mechanics is self-adjoint operators. So that's a quantum mechanical technicality that, that you need to worry about if your Hilbert spaces are infinite dimensional. So we don't need to worry about that because our Hilbert spaces are finite dimensional. Hermitian and self-adjoint mean the same thing. Okay, thanks. Now, Hans? Well, first, first, I think it's, I want to say that it's uh, very exciting, your starting point um, um, with, with a bare, bare Hamiltonian as, as a starting point and, and stripping away everything classical. I think more, more should be done in this way rather than starting from the classical point of view. Um, it reminds me of a it reminds me of a, a quote from uh, Pascal Jordan, one of the founders of quantum mechanics and the inventor of second quantization. He was very unhappy with quantization as a procedure, and he was hoping for uh, quantum physics or quantum mechanics without crutches. I think he was saying. Good. So the, like cr it. the crutches were then the quantization pr procedure, which was arbitrary or. or so it's, it's very good that someone uh, brings this up and makes it into a, a working program. But unfortunately, I, I lose you uh, at step <laughs> two here. <laughs> good, I, have, no. I I have difficulties in, in um, seeing how, once you have factorized your, your uh, Hilbert space using this minimization, you identify individual um, clusters of things that lo locally interact. What I don't understand is your jump from these these um, lo local systems to uh, points in space time, so uh, or in space rather. So I'm thinking from from the point of view of general relativity, where we have also a redundant um, mathematical description. We start with the manifold space time, and then on top of that the metric field, and on top of that the matter fields. And then due to um, diffeomorphism invariance, we realize that the only physical relationships are between the matter field and the uh, metric field, and we can take away the manifold. The space-time points is, is, does not contain any physical information. So what I can see is that you, in your factorization and localization uh, step, have identified clusters of matter on the, on the matter field um, um, level, but how, why do you go over to a, to a space time there or a space rather? Uh, when in in general relativity with great difficulty we have gotten rid of rid of that. It seems somehow that you're reverting to a classical way of thinking in in contradiction with your original uh, aspirations here. So in space time the space-time points do not exist in general relativity, they have no physical relevance. The only thing is closeness, rel relative interactions between matter, matter fields and, and the, the metric. Uh, 
And when you start identifying these individual clusters of matter with space-time points, you are somehow assuming an absolute space of New Newton's kind, uh, kind of uh, substantialist, substantialist uh, idea of, of, of space-time rather than uh, this um, free of classicality approach that you started with. So I, that's why I lose your, I can't really formulate my, my question here. I just can't follow you this short step you take from clusters of matter to points in the space time, which really shouldn't necessarily be there. Good, so I think, uh, I appreciate that your question is, is um, that, that you're not exactly sure what the question is because I, neither am I, but I, I think there are two points that you're raising that are very, very interesting and important that maybe just saying them out loud will, will help. Um, one is that, you know, sure, there's a point of view in general relativity where doesn't, there's no, you know, because of diffeomorphism invariance, there's no way of gauge invariantly specifying a point in space. But like you say, um, you can represent the fact that points have a distance between each other or, you know, in space time, a space time interval, uh, there's a relational uh, fact notion between different points in space time. And that's basically what is recovered here effectively, I think, even though the language is different. Uh, we're saying that even in general relativity, if I say I do poke the space time manifold at a point, there's a very well defined sense in which there is a causal cone that goes to the future that describes how that influence can propagate in the domain of influence in, in general relativity. And we see something like that emerge in our Hilbert space structure. If you have the right kind of Hamiltonian, the interactions in Hilbert space will be such that you have that kind of light cone structure uh, in the influences propagating in the, in the green function or whatever you wanna call it. Um, that's sort of the, 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 the positive spin I can put on it. The, the other side is just to say, yes, this picture is sort of fundamentally not starting from a diffeomorphism invariant description of reality. I don't even know what that would mean to, in Hilbert space to be diffeomorphism invariant. Um, it's not even Lorentz invariant because it's a finite dimensional Hilbert space and you cannot have a representation of a non-compact symmetry group on a finite dimensional vector space, strictly speaking. So my guess, and this is just a guess because I don't think we understand it well enough yet. My guess is that if this kind of picture works at all, both Lorentz invariance and diffeomorphism invariance will only be approximate. They will be things that emerge uh, in some level of description that is not exactly exact. and. I'm sympathetic to the worry that that's a step backwards, you know, that we worked so hard in the early 20th century to establish Lorentz invariance and, uh, and, and diffeomorphism invariance, and those are key starting points for physics these days. And I'm saying that they're not fundamental in this picture. So I could be wrong about that. It's absolutely possible, but that seems to be to be where you get to just by following your nose and doing the quantum mechanics. Yeah. Uh, I don't think of diffeomorphism invariance principally as a, as an invariance of the mathematical structure. I'm thinking of that. This means that the only physical physical content of the theory is relations between matter fields and relations between these and the metric field. Um, and there's no space time under, under, under underlying that. That's for me diffeomorphism in that consequences of diffeomorphism events. And and the, the light cone structure you're talking about that doesn't live in space time that lives in the metric field. The, the space time doesn't have any such structure. Space time is just a, a manifold, four dimensional real manifold. Everything like Lorentz invariance and such comes from the metric field. So, so well, I, I encourage you to take all those statements and translate them into Hilbert space language and then write a paper and then cite us. <laughs> okay, in 10 years, perhaps. <laughs> I'll wait until you finish your program first. To okay, see. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Pavel. Yeah, hi. Uh, so, this is a very, this was a very interesting talk, and this looks like, of course, a very interesting program. So uh, uh, I just wanted to uh, make an observation that if we look at uh, all the various attempts that uh, essentially want to derive gravity over the past, say, 30, 40 years, 
we see a pattern that whenever you propose, whenever you kind of come up with the notion of a matrix, and then add to that some reasonable postulates or uh, relations or some reasonable kind of uh, physics, then you easily uh, arrive at Einstein's equations in linear or nonlinear form. So you get that from string theory with various with, with very simple assumptions from matrix models from uh, Jacob, Jacobson's approach from the YSK model, uh, Valindi's entropic gravity. So it seems like a general feature that you, you have a matrix, you couple that with some reasonable assumptions, you automatically end up with, with the correct theory of gravity at the classical level, the classical gravity equations. Uh, so is, could one think of some further criteria to distinguish between uh, these different ways of deriving gravity to say that, okay, this one, so like there are certain things that you could derive very generically uh, and it does not tell you that your approach is really correct. And there are certain other things that you cannot derive using very generic considerations. And that would essentially tell you that, okay, your approach actually is very like, uh, is special. And by your approach, I mean, I don't mean the specific approach we are looking at here, but sure. as, as a general criterion. Yeah, no, actually I'm completely sympathetic uh, to everything you said here. Like the fact that we got Einstein's equation is not the big surprising triumph. Like you say, like, what else are you gonna get? Well, <laughs> if you imagine you're getting a metric on space time that is more or less reasonable, uh, other than adding some extra fields to make it a scalar tensor theory or something like that, you're generally gonna get Einstein's equation, especially if you just look at the weak field limit. Um, so that's not the, the triumph here. The, you know, the, the triumph, to, to the extent there are any triumphs, is that it hasn't crashed and burned yet. That you know, we can really just start with a spectrum of a Hamiltonian and get as far as we have. And so I, I, I absolutely imagine, so there, there's two possible, uh, sorry, there are three possible futures for this program, okay? One is that we just complete it that we say, oh yes, here is, we figured out what the right spectrum needs to be. We get quantum gravity with the standard model <laughs> in a, with a cutoff, the whole bit, it all just works. This is a good way of thinking about uh, the universe. There's another way that says, well, you know, once you try to think more carefully about what you mean by the right spectrum of the Hamiltonian, so that you get not only weak field gravity, but strong field gravity and black holes and, and you know, gauge fields propagating on it, what you've really done is just invent string theory in a really, really hard way or, or whatever the right theory is, right? Like you've gone really backwards uh, to, to invent something that could be said much simpler in a, in a completely different way. And the third possibility is that it just like, no, this doesn't work. It just completely fails that there's something different about the universe that you have completely forgotten about. All three of these possibilities are very, very much on the table. So. I, I'm not claiming that we're better than anyone else because we got Einstein's equation. Like, like you said, if you don't get Einstein's equation, then you don't even get in the door in, in, in this game. Okay, uh, Zhao. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I noticed that in your procedure, you didn't specify a particular me measure for entanglement, uh, but somehow I feel like this is the most important uh, part of this procedure. Are, are you doing that because you, you're not expecting any at least qualitative difference uh, in the resulting geometry? And likewise, there is, I guess there's also ambiguity in, in the choice of the function that you map from entanglement measure to geometry me measure, which I guess is obviously only distance, uh, but still there's this ambiguity in the mapping function, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and uh, it was only because this is a colloquium, not a seminar, and I was not being as technical as I could be. In the paper, we actually use the mutual information between two subfactors of Hilbert space um, as the measure of entanglement, and then we define roughly minus the logarithm of the mutual information is the distance measure uh, that we that we look at. And that's not going to be exactly right. That's going to depend on what kind of matter propagating you have in space time. You know, is it massive or massless and things like that. At that level of, of specificity, we do not uh, pick uh, 
one particular function. So that's open to be thought about once you understand the theory of everything a little bit better. Uh, but no, in, in principle, to, to go all the way, you need to be very specific about that stuff. And we think it's possible to be specific about it. Do you have any uh, reason to choose one particular measure over the others? Because I think I've also seen papers using concurrence and uh, other stuff instead of uh, mutual information. Well, we're not going to claim that it's unique. You know, we're not going to claim that it's obviously the right one. Mutual information is an obvious thing to look at that satisfies all the criteria you'd expect uh, a distance measure to have. You know, it's symmetric. It is independent of any choice of operators or anything like that. So it seems like the natural thing to use. But if someone has a better one, then I'm certainly open to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question is: uh, there, there are multiple counter examples in one dimension that breaks the area law of entanglement entropy, where the, you can specify a uh, Hamiltonian that's, you can write this Hamiltonian in the coordinate space and it's local, it's designed to be local in the sense that they are hopping, either hopping or transposition between nearest neighbors. However, they're in, uh, their entanglement between different uh, uh, degrees of freedom are larger if the, the distance between them are far, is farther apart. So would this still fit in your program? Or uh, I, I guess I'm a little bit confused about the logic here. Are you starting from a particular Hamiltonian to derive the geometry of general relativity or uh, you can start with any Hamiltonian and then you, you will end up with a space that corresponds to arbitrary Hamiltonian. Yeah, no, it's certainly not true that you can start with an arbitrary Hamiltonian. An arbitrary, an arbitrary Hamiltonian would give you nonsense, would give you nothing like space or locality or anything like that. The, the local laws of physics that we have in our low energy world are very, very non-generic in terms of Hamiltonians. I mean, just think about the actual way you write the Hamiltonian of a field theory. It's an integral over space of some operators. Uh, that's, that's highly non-generic, uh, you know, in terms of all the operators you could possibly write down. Uh, but we're not starting with a specific Hamiltonian because we don't know the right one. So what we're doing is we're starting with properties we recognize that the Hamiltonian of the world has and then trying to reverse engineer them into the Hamiltonians that we look at. What are the features you need in a Hamiltonian to make this kind of program work? Mm -hmm. mm, but still those existing uh, counterexamples in, in, in mostly spin chains, they they're the starting Hamiltonian in written in coordinate space is uh, is local, but uh, but once people have uh, solved the ground state and then they use this entanglement uh, measure to map to a particular geometry, then they find this uh, it's not the it's not the the geometry where where neighbors are closer from. Uh, closer uh, from each other rather than farther apart. So uh, would this um, I mean, be s some, something that, that should be excluded from this program? Uh, the, any, anything that breaks area law of entanglement entropy, I think would, would not uh, because locality seems to be very, very key in your, in your procedure, right? And if, uh, if the locality in real space isn't uh, in, after this whole procedure, the loca same locality that in the geometry that you derive, would this be some inconsistency? Well, uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on here because, you know, uh, it, it might just be that the Hamiltonian in the world is not of that kind of, of the one that you're thinking about. But uh, at the more basic level, you know, we've only done the sort of bulk weak field local version of this, or at least we've only published that version. Uh, you would want in a more full version to be able to have more holographic uh, 
behavior uh, where things are not explicitly local in the particular metric that you're looking at. And so like, that's the, to me, the exciting thing is that you can really think about questions of holography and horizon complementarity from a Hilbert space point of view. What are the features of the Hamiltonian and the eigen spectrum of the Hamiltonian that you need to recover those deviations from locality in some way, but we haven't done it yet. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, three now. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the nice talk. So I was wondering how does the uh, nonlinearity of general relativity emerge in this description? Does it, like, is there a statement that you can make in terms of entanglement why gravity can be its own source or something in that direction? I, I don't know yet is the short answer. Um, I mean, there is a usual way of bootstrapping your way into the nonlinear Einstein equations by saying that gravitational excitations uh, also act as sources for the gravitational field. And that sort of uniquely completes to Einstein's equation. Um, and maybe something like that works in this, in this case, but I don't know. And it would be hard to establish something like that because basically you need to solve the Hamiltonian Exactly, <laughs> uh, for a nonlinear interacting field theory, you know, quantized. So it'd be, it'd be hard. Uh, that's not to say it's not important to do, but it's not one of the low hanging fruits in this mm -hmm. program. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so, sort of connecting to this last question, Sean. Um, in, in your talk, you were talking about recovering some sort of like weak field limit, right? Um, do you think we are close to maybe recovering something like a mini superspace? from GR and it's sort of like the whole nonlinear number to positive gravity, just the sort of like FRW cosmology? Well, we certainly haven't done FRW cosmology explicitly. We did write another paper uh, thinking about FRW cosmology in terms of qubits um, and entangled qubits giving rise to an expanding space time, but it was very hand wavy. I, like I, I almost don't wanna uh, uh, claim too much for it. Uh, I think that that is an area that you that one could make a lot of progress on that hasn't yet been made. So I, I think it's sort of clear how to go about uh, thinking about that, but I haven't actually done it. Okay, maybe one closing question uh, connected to Fabat's question. So looking back in history, uh, at some point New Newton proposed uh, Newtonian mechanics, and then we had later Einstein with relativity, and now there is quantum mechanics. And you know, like we probed quantum mechanics up to 10 TV or so. Um, and that's far from the Planck scale. Um, historically speaking, a math induction would tell us that probably we, are, we haven't got the correct underlying mechanics of the world, but somehow you are betting your, your, your coins on this, that this is gonna to remain to be the case. Why do you think this is different this time? Well, I think that there's a couple things. Um, number one, I don't think that that's a historical lesson that you can draw. There's no momentum or, or, or periodicity to how often you need uh, a revolution in our fundamental understanding of physics. I'm very open to the possibility that it might not be quantum mechanics at the fundamental level. Um, but I think unlike the situation after Newtonian mechanics, um, you know, when Newtonian mechanics came on board, it was very beautiful and, and many people thought like, okay, this is certainly the framework in which we're gonna work and it's gonna be a matter of figuring out what the right particles and forces are. Not everyone, like when we pinpointed the second law of thermodynamics, a lot of people said that that was a autonomous law over and above Newtonian mechanics. Um, but also no one claimed, well, you know, we, we, we know why tables are solid on the basis of Newtonian mechanics. Like we know, what, they didn't know about atoms or anything like that, right? There's clearly large number of things that just hadn't yet been put under the umbrella of Newtonian mechanics. And I don't think quantum mechanics is the same way. It might be wrong, it might be incomplete, but we have zero evidence from anything that we know about the physical world that quantum mechanics is insufficient to cover that particular situation. So I, I'm, I admire people who want to generalize or go beyond quantum mechanics, but they're just randomly moving out in directions, right? Like there's no guidance from the empirical world on what to do. So, I mean, Stephen Wolfram is doing that, right? He's saying like, maybe there's a hypergraph and you're gonna derive quantum mechanics from that. You know, uh, God bless him. But uh, at the end of the day, he's gonna derive quantum mechanics uh, or he better and then I can do my program. 
right? So, uh, you know, if as long as quantum mechanics is true at some level, what we're trying to do uh, is, is an interesting thing to try to do. And if there's something more fundamental behind it, then that's great. Okay, that's a good point to, to stop. So thanks again for, for the talk. It was very, very good. And for the time uh, spent on answering questions. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thanks for accommodating my time zone a little bit. I, I do appreciate it. Of course. Okay.